Hi, my name is Andrea Miller. I am your host of Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm joined by my amazing co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and our amazing producer, Brian Adkins. Woo, we have a doozy of a show for you. If you are dating, you must consume this show because our guest, Sabrina Zohar, is one of the foremost dating coaches. And she helps us understand everything from when it's time to go exclusive to how do you deal with ghosting to making sure your profile picture matches what you actually look like and so much more. She keeps it real and so entertaining. And even if you're not dating, if you're in a relationship or if you're like, you know what, I can't even deal with dating anymore. Stick with us, folks, because we talk about how radical accountability can transform your life. No joke. Radical accountability is the way to set yourself free and be in relationship with whether it's your parent, your child, your spouse, and critically with yourself. So let me introduce Sabrina Zohar. Welcome, Sabrina Zohar. Sabrina is a social media superstar, dating expert, and successful entrepreneur. She is the founder of Software, a sustainable clothing brand. She runs Do the Work, a private coaching practice aimed at helping people succeed in relationships and is the host of the super popular, super helpful podcast, also called Do the Work. Welcome, Sabrina. Great to have you on Open Relationships. Thanks, guys. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the introduction. I do appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. It's really, it's it's super cool to meet you and we're big fans of all the work that you do and just recognizing it feels like we're kindred spirits. So, so thanks for being on the show. Let's get into it. You talk about how you dated a bunch of guys who would send you these really sweet good morning texts, including one guy who sent you the same text along with 17 other women. Oh my God. Oh, is that what it's really like out there right now is that is a good morning text a red flag with when is it appropriate or inappropriate to send one okay so here's my thing with the texting and the red and the, all of these things on paper is a good morning text an issue it's like no to the person that can handle understanding that a good morning text does not mean much besides it's literally someone saying good morning where it becomes i would say like detrimental to our dating lives is when people put the weight and the importance on what time they text me good morning, how often they're doing it, but did they put a period behind it or did they do an exclamation point? That hyper vigilance of what, but it's 9 a.m. and they haven't texted me yet. And it's like, I was her. The only reason I can speak so candidly was because I was the girl that would call her mom and say, oh my God, he didn't text me yet today. Like this guy doesn't like me. And my mom would be on the other line going, Sabrina, what the fuck are you talking about? Like you just saw this person last night. And so what we have to remember is like a good morning text can be sent while someone's taking a shit. It could be sent while like it could literally you can automate it. I've had guys I've seen someone send a text to someone while they're laying in bed next to me. So the reason I bring light to this is like a good morning text is adorable when you're in a relationship. But the problem is that people expect all of these things prior to being in a relationship. And if we know anything about neuroscience, which we're starting to learn all of these things of how to practically incorporate neuroscience into our day to day, is that when you start having someone sending you a good morning text, that unpredictability causes this dopamine hit of every day. Are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? You start to get on this addiction loop. Once you get on that, it's really, really tough to get off of it because think about them as like heroin. Um, Britt Frank is a neuropsychotherapist I love and she always talks about that of they're just replicating a drug that you would normally get, you know, through a needle. And so if we know all of that, we have to be able to kind of put our like adult pants on to say a good morning text while it might be adorable and sweet does not mean this person wants a relationship, does not mean that they have intentions for anything beyond that, does not mean that they see you in any different light. They might just simply know that Everybody wants a good morning text, so they're going to do it. Otherwise, they know that you might not talk to them if they don't get it. Oh, boy. That's, I mean, it it makes a ton of sense. And yet it's like, when I think of the, the, decep the deception in, you know, in, in automating it and sending it to so many people, I mean, I, it's like, like there's so much to unpack there. Um, so, I mean, so... What what did you do when you found out that that guy was sending it to 17 other people? Did you did you address it with him? And, you know, and then what? And Here's how the did you find out? 
Uh, I found out because my friend had her friend who was also seeing the same guy. This was before the Are You Be Dating the Same Guy groups came out. And I was telling her about him and she was like, wait a minute, my friend is giving me the same play by play. And then we just started to piece it together. I was like, you're dating, you're you're doing this. I've actually had a guy incorrectly text me when he was actually meant to text another girl. And I caught him and I was like, this wasn't meant for me. And it was very obvious that it was like, oh, you matched with another girl while you and I were planning our date. You're talking to somebody else. And like at the end of the day, like, of course, it's gut wrenching. And here's the saddest part. I'd love to come off and be like, oh, my God, the minute I found out, I said I'm done and I walked away. And it's like, no, I didn't. I'd be bullshitting you. What did I do? I saw that as, well, I'm going to be the one that he chooses. I'm going to be the girl. I'm going to be the one out of the 17 that gets this person. I hate to break it to everybody that didn't saw what happened. That's not how that panned out. And that guy ended up being single for three years after because this person was chasing a feeling, that unpredictability, that are they going to like me? Are they going to want me? Are they going to choose me? That's his shit, right? And my shit was, okay, but are you going to choose me? Are you actually going to, am I going to be the one? Because I had this fallacy that changing someone, you know, you see in the movies like, oh, she changed him, right? She mm-hmm. she made him a better guy. And it's like we see it as the bad boy who's a womanizer. And all of a sudden he becomes this like, he I choose to you. find the right woman, the right that's woman it. that and- will kind of just rein that all in. Right. And that's what I perceived it as like, you know, we think about like my mom married a narcissist and she's like back in the day, Sab. All we saw was housekeeping magazine saying how to make your man happy, how to please him. How do you what's wrong with you that your partner's not happy? So that was my M.O. for going for so long, so long, so long versus understanding like, wait a minute, this person is just chasing a feeling. This person is not actually genuinely interested in me. They just like the dynamic that they get because of the unpredictability. And then what that said about me was. I just wanted someone to choose me because I had daddy issues. I had my own traumas and my own core wounds. Instead of loving myself enough to say, this doesn't work for me, I'm going to walk away. I was so desperate to have other people love me more than I loved myself. And that's why I started to just believe anything guys would say. Something as simple as a good morning text meant they like me. And it's like, no, 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 no. That guy just wanted to get laid. So before anybody blames this on apps, texting, technology i had a very similar thing happen to me way before that when you had to like push 72 buttons to text somebody on your little tiny candy bar phone oh yeah mine was hot pink and i had a it's it's too long of a story to tell right now someday i will but it was the same thing where he was dating all sorts of women and instead of good morning texts it was little stuff like showing up with a little gift but it was the same kind of thing where there was that unpredictability. it was like Is he going to show up tonight? Is he going to follow through on our plans? Is he going to call? And that high from the inconsistency felt like this is meant to be. My brain tricked me into thinking I'm the right one for him. So it just it's it's weird human nature. And I wish we'd understood all that neurobiology you had just named back in 2002 and 2003. So I could have saved a year of my life. <laughs> it, and it, like, I think I'm so glad you said that of like, we can't keep blaming the apps. It's like, of course, the casino always wins. Like, do I know that going into gamble that the house is going to win more often than not? It's a business. OK, I understand how profit and and gains work here. So it's less about, oh, it's everyone else. And sometimes we have to look and go, am I being a better buyer? Because also that unpredictability, what we then the other flip side of that, especially like for me, it was a pattern. I consistently had those experiences. Then we have to look and go, oh, no, no, no. That's familiar for me. That's reminiscent of my dad. That's the that's the devil I know. That's the, oh, my brain, because we have to look. When we know about the brain, the brain loves shortcuts. The brain loves going from feeling a fucked, right? It feels something. It goes right back into the limbic system. You go back into the amygdala, which is, I felt this before. I'm overwhelmed. And your brain is like, hey, she can't handle this or they can't handle this, whoever this is for. For me, it's she. Um, I can't handle this. So just shut down and do what she always does because that's a coping mechanism. And we know that her father made her feel like this. So this guy must work the same. Our brain is not designed. And when I say our brain is not designed to help us grow, that's not why it was created. It was designed to keep us safe and to have shortcuts of she's overwhelmed. Do this. So when we know all of this and we start to look at the dating landscape and we start to realize like the psychology and the neuroscience behind it, it actually becomes so clear what was so muddy before. Joanna, like you said, it's not just about like, oh, it's the app's fault. It's like, no, this is human nature because that's how the brain works. But you know, the one that's acting like a casino is the one that's manipulating you. It's not, I mean, the apps do that, but all the apps do that. Every single program does it. The person that is giving you intermittent dopamine 
boost is that person who's manipulating you. They don't even realize that they are doing it, but they know it works. Because it feels good to them too. That's where I go chasing a feeling. You know, and like I hear all the time of like, oh, well, the spark, right? And I don't have that. And it's like, I don't want you to not feel anything. Like I wouldn't want you to go out with someone and be like, you know, if you lived or died to tomorrow, it wouldn't matter. It's like, no, of course, we want you to have a connection with somebody. But when you're chasing a feeling of I need the spark and I need this, I need to feel this. Well, here's the reality. One, feelings aren't facts. But two, feelings are fleeting. They don't always last. Imagine if you were always joyful. Well, then, but you wouldn't appreciate the joy if you didn't have the sadness. So if we if we have this resilient mentality of no, well, no, we I need the contrast, it, right? We need, we need the contrast, right? So otherwise, it even even joy and those feelings of connectedness uh, that becomes boring, right? I mean, we need it's like human beings need variability. But let me um, let me just rewind. You talk about clearly the validation issues you were looking for, which is super common. You talk about, um, you call them daddy issues in kind of a, a little bit of an offhanded way, but it from from getting to know you, the narcissism that you describe with your dad sounds really fucking painful. And like, yeah, it was and like, and here's the thing, when you start to unpack all of your childhood, I saw it as it was just my father for so long. And I couldn't understand why I wasn't able to like effectively move forward until I started to realize my mother played a part in this. My mother betrayed me. My mother abandoned me. My mother chose my father all of those years. She knew he was hitting us. She saw all of those things. She was so in her trauma. She was so in her shit of being a little girl. My mom had so many she has a story that like brings me to tears when I think about her childhood. So she was just a little girl in that moment as well, going, I, I don't know what to do here. Then I had my sister who betrayed me, my brother who betrayed me, all of these things. So then when we look at this healing landscape, yeah, of course, I have that really, truly narcissistic, just like he is textbook narcissist. Like every therapist, every one of my friends, even when we talk, they're like, oh, that, that. You didn't even have to go much. I, I I saw that from the beginning. Well, and by that, you mean he always made it about him. It, it, the grandiosity. It, you use these even simple examples. It's like you talk about like buying blueberries. And it's like, oh, my God, I, I know where to get the best blueberries for the best. I mean, these simple things that that are like so freaking relatable when that that human being, our caregivers consistently make it about themselves that it's like there's no room for for you as a kid when we think about from zero to seven zero to ten is called egocentric age and like i've been actually working with a therapist who's very who only deals with narcissism to understand the impact that age is so developmental we as children need to be narcissistic that's how you learn your identity that's how you learn who you are is it the world is all about you as it should be you're a child you don't know anything else Having the parent that I had, that narcissistic who everything's about him, narcissistic rage, wildly inconsistent, would explode at nowhere, would take everything personal. He saw us as extensions of him. So yeah. we, we, we were, uh, if we took any attention away from my mother, if my mother had to turn to the kids, that sacrificed who he was. Then he still needed to be the center of attention, which is where then all of us were vying for the attention of our caregivers because my father was the one who had to run the show. Right. Yeah, you That's had a plink, Tim. Well, go just rewind for a moment with your mom. Um, did you ever confront her with her role? And and are you guys, where are you guys today in terms of a relationship? My mom, I would put myself in fire for my mother because it came during COVID was the breaking point was when I, I started my healing journey after I married my father. I was with somebody who was the exact same person and I came complete rock bottom. It was a whole fucking thing. And I started doing the work, I started doing the work and really realizing, and I came to my mom one day during COVID and I said, I love you, but I need to be honest that you impact me equally as hard as other people. And if you're not willing to get help, then I think our relationship needs to stay more shallow because I can't continue like this. It wasn't an ultimatum, you, you do what you want. She dove into therapy and every day we talk now of like, she'll be like, hey, Sab, you know, this came up for me and I'm teaching her how to do inner child meditations and I'm helping her and she takes full accountability. She's the one who will call me and like, I'll tell her, you know, mom, I, I did this thing in therapy and I realized about dad and she'll break down saying, I am so sorry I failed you. I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you and I, I need you to know how much I love you and how appalling, you know, just she oh is God. able. Super mom. My mom is, she's the fucking best. Whereas my father she has to kind of compensate for that because there is no- Are they still time. married? No, no. They got divorced when I was 14. They dated for five years after because my dad would go back and forth and all my mom wanted was a family. 
You know, she just wanted her husband and her kids. And then actually we were the ones who told my mom, like, if you don't break it off, we're done. And she are finally you, did. Are you in touch with your dad at all? Uh, we speak probably like once every two, three weeks of like a text, like, hey, how are you? Good. How are you? And the reason being is because his texts are, are you happy? And if you say, what does that mean, dad? Just be happy. Oh, oh okay. All right. I'll, I'll just, okay, cool. I'll just be happy. I've had to accept, I had a year and a half where I didn't speak to him. And that takes to me a lot of strength as a child to decide that you do not want a relationship with your caregiver, that you don't have to be guilted just because they're your parent. And I stepped away and I was with my partner and the decision to walk away from my father when he had, I was, I was done. It was his last, you're a fucking piece of shit and go blah, 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 all of that. He and would I said, say that I, to you? We literally same sentence would be my love. You look beautiful. Oh my God. I'm so proud of you. And I, I remember looking at my friend being like, and she was like, your dad's so sweet. And then he said, oh, do you all this, this summer we're going to, tr- we'll all travel here. And I said, well, no, 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 I'm not talking. My brother and I have a, a, a bit of an issue with our relationship. And I set a boundary. I said, no, no, I'm not going to go at this point. If we're all going to be there, we haven't spoken about it. That's that narcissistic rage. You fucking piece of shit. Don't you fucking come. Does and he, then just does exploded. He, does he have bipolar potentially? I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I don't. Narcissistic rage. Narcissistic rage is like that because they are so tethered to getting their narcissistic supply that if it gets cut off, it feels like a bipolar behavior. Somebody says no. I mean, it's like to to for somebody to tell them no, for them to not have that control is like a fucking freak out. Um. Okay, but hang on. So let's talk about your sister and your brother. What's what's the scoop with each of them? My, I love my sister. She and I are working on a relationship, but she has been a voice. She's very, both of them are older. I'm the youngest. So I, my brother, when I was nine, my brother was sent away. Like, have you guys seen all those uh, documentaries of like those home, those schools, those programs for the drugs? That was my brother. So my brother got sent to a wilderness program. He had a drug addiction. My parents didn't know what to do. He was arrested. It was a whole thing. So again, I didn't have a household where I was the last. It was Joe is the issue. Joe has ADHD. Oh, now Jamie's acting out. Now Jamie's starting to do drugs at 12. Oh, she's been indoctrinated by Joe, who was, there was no space for me. So I would be like, when I'd be bullied or I'd come home from school crying, there was no one there. There was no one to deal with that because the bandwidth was my father, my brother, my sister. So Joe was sent away. We didn't speak for four years. He did the wilderness program and the drug program and all of that. The issue, the reason that we don't have a relationship right now is because he's not willing to accept that my father's a narcissist. He's not willing to accept that the program he went through fucked him up. He doesn't think he needs therapy. He says, I've done it all. I'm good. Okay. Oh, wow. Whereas my sister, she's incredibly avoidant. She shuts down at anything. Like, she can't handle it. She's now starting to understand. She just has been starting to see a trauma specialist where she said, hey... I think you're right. I think we have some fucking issues. I was the black sheep. I started all of this. I was the first to say something's not right here. And I knew it because my romantic relationships were mimicking that. I was constantly seeking the same things and I was going after my father. Yeah. So then what happened? So you got married to somebody who it sounds like was also a narcissist. And how long were you together? When I say I was a shell of a human, and like I have a part in this, I am never gonna only blame the other person. Like, mama held a responsibility here. I was so toxic. I was so unhealthy. I just wanted anyone to choose me. And he was replaying those dynamics. He was uh, the memory that comes to mind, if you want to know about the narcissist, was I need, I had these stomach pains, I had these crazy pains, and I didn't know what was going on. And I fell on the floor one day and I was like, I need to go to the hospital, help. And he literally walked over me and turned around and goes, Get the fuck over it. You're not the only one who's ever been in pain. I have a meeting. And so then oh. my sister had to come. She took me to the ER. And then when he came to pick me up, he was annoyed that he had to come into the city because we lived in Brooklyn, that I inconvenienced him. And then his mother called me to tell me, how dare I ask her son to cancel a meeting because I need to go to the doctor. It's just gas, Sabrina. You're being dramatic. Oh, wow. That's what I dealt. That was what I dealt with, With was him constantly gaslighting. And he would say, I think one of us loves you more than the other, meaning he loved me more than I loved myself. And he would try to say as if he was, you know, Sabrina, I'm doing all this to help you. You're just not seeing it. And it was very manipulative. He was very controlling. He started to alienate me. I wasn't, I didn't have any friends. I was, I was 30 pounds lighter than I am now to the point where people were asking, just even seeing me, people were like, the high stress, I call that the high stress diet. (laughs) No good. (laughs) To say the least. I know some people go towards food as their coping mechanism. I go the other way where I'm like, I, cause I'm dysregulated. My nervous system's like, she can't eat. She's in survival mode. The day he left, he left me to go to see his parents and I was uninvited because 
um, I we got into a fight and that was the day I remember like I sat I was with my mom my mom came to fly to New York immediately because she knew I couldn't be alone and I was walking in Manhattan I walked across the street and I tripped and I remember I fell and there was a bus coming and I didn't get up and my mom literally came and grabbed me out of the street and that's when I realized like oh my god you hit, I have hit, you rock. hit rock bottom holy shit that, how long ago was that in 2018 oh wow well I mean holy bucket sister i mean it's amazing to think of hitting rock bottom just six years ago and the just dramatic tremendous success that you've had so and you talk about doing so a congratulations and thank you because so many people will relate to either the entirety of your story or or bits of it and all of us can relate to feeling lost and fucking alone and confused and what i love is how much you have done and even the your point about being accountable it's like you were continuing to play the same role in your pattern is what i'm hearing from you and that is so common and that's one of the things i love to talk about on the show it's like only we can set ourselves free and so often we're, we're pointing our finger outward and it's all about the other people and everyone around us sucks and while that might be true and <laughs> they probably do suck a lot of the time it's like well why do we keep choosing them so so now you've got you've got um, a whole business on doing the work. I have my my interpretation of that, but what do you mean by do period the period work period? To me, what doing the work means is like having to face yourself, having to cultivate a self awareness, having to bridge the gap between the me's that were kind of all those parts of myself, learning to love myself authentically, not love myself by I do a bunch of bubble baths and I buy myself a bunch of stuff. Yeah. It's bullshit like, self. Yeah. There's a lot of bullshit self care out there that I just kind of want to call out and say, can we just quit pretending that that's actual meaningful lasting self care? I mean, it's nice, but it, it's really superficial. Okay. Please, completely. Please continue. For me, what doing the work means is taking radical accountability of my part in things is by being able to like, and it's true, like you said, to your point, I love the that. amount Radical of accountability. Yes. The amount of people that I get that fucking attack me of like, you don't even, and it's like, cause you don't want to take accountability. Like I even, I have a client that I fucking love and she knows how much I love her, but she started dating someone new and everything is, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And why isn't he, why isn't he, why isn't he? And the amount of times I have to stop and go, you're full of shit. You want, even an example, she told him, we're going to get like a week prior, next Friday, I'm off of work. Let's get dinner. And he was like, okay. Like he didn't realize. Then the day came and he was like, hey, I'm so sorry. I have my son. She was like, I don't understand. How dare you forget? And blah, blah, blah. And I kept saying, you know, he's a human, right? All of a sudden, rolls over. She messaged me this morning. I think he's going, and she didn't even realize what she was doing. And she's like, ah, uh, I'm supposed to see him. I think he's going away Thursday. I can't remember, blah, blah. I don't know, whatever. Oh, I can't remember the his hypocrisy, schedule. hypocrisy, right? And I stopped her and I said, dude, you're full of shit. I said, last week you held him to, the, you nailed him to a cross because he didn't remember the one day you were off of work because you are the main character in your own fucking movie. You are nothing to anybody else. And I hate to be the one to humble everybody down. You ain't shit to my movie. I'm not shit to yours. I don't hold that much weight in your life and you don't hold that much weight into mine. But the accountability is the hard part because people don't want to do that. It's easier to say, well, I'm not doing anything because the reality is a lot of us are coming from that place of being a child. As a child, you're right, I didn't have a choice. As a child, when my father would hit us and walk out, what was I going to do at six years old? I would. The, the sad thing was I would pack my bags. Who was going to come get me? As an adult now, I get to make choices. I get to say that doesn't work for me or, hey, this is whatever, right? And I think a lot of people forget that. The amount of emails I'll get saying, what do I do? Yeah. What, what would you tell a friend, right? I can't tell you what to do, but that's part of doing the work is understanding I play a part in every fucking situation that happens. So short of abuse, which we're not talking about those extremes, of course, that is not, no one has it. You've never asked for it. It's the same with women. Like you didn't ask for it. You didn't get that. You didn't deserve this. None of that. So we're going to put those aside. We're talking for the average norm relationship, right? You play a part and that part could be I didn't set boundaries. I allowed it. Like with my narcissistic ex, I could go on the moon, the stars, and the sun if he did all of these things to me. Yeah. But the common denominator and was- he did. I, it's you. It was me. And I allowed totally. it because my self-esteem believed that's all I was worth. I didn't believe so, that I was worthy of more. I feel like the line between that being victim blamey and that being empowering is in understanding that we can forgive ourselves and forgive others 
when they are not at the point yet where they can it, they can make a better choice. I think about that cheating ex that I had and we broke up and he was trying to win me back. And this gal that I worked with had this gorgeous, rock, literal rock star guitarist brother. And she's like, I've been dying to set you up with Jeff. He's so sweet. And I got on the phone with <clears throat> Jeff because, you know, he called my home phone. It was 2003. And he was like, so sweet. And we set up a date. And then the ex came back, this that I believe is also a narcissist. And the story was so compelling. And I fell for it. And I canceled my date with Jeff, the nice guy. And I didn't understand then that Jeff walking away from that situation was the sign that he was healthy. Instead, to me, it was like he didn't fight for me. So it because I wanted a fight, I took back in the a-hole, right? But I couldn't have done differently then. I didn't know then. What's empowering is to understand I didn't cause the cheater to cheat. But now that I know better, I don't have to allow someone to do it again. And that's where the empowering thing comes in. Not a that thousand you screwed percent. up. Yeah. A thousand percent. It, and that's not me, your fault that you couldn't do it. Now yeah. you get to do a different thing, though. Yeah, I just, when I think about some, so I used to be so laden with guilt and regret, and I have really tried to turn that around and notice when I've made progress and wh where I've overcome those habits. Because let's face it, the guilt and regret is also part of the pattern. I mean, and talk about how to fuck yourself up. It's like, I'm trying really, really hard, but if I'm not perfect, then I am not going to give myself any credit whatsoever, right? And so this idea of, really noticing your own progress and really noticing your own growth. So exactly to your point, Joanna, you won't get into those situations again. Or if you do, you'll handle it so differently and you'll be more mature and wiser. And even then, I mean, let's face it, there is so much, I mean, especially at my age, freaking in my 50s, like there is a lot of, of um, wiring and firing that needs to get unwired, right? Yeah. And, you know, a lot of those patterns take a lot of time to replace in their entirety or at least in, in their majority. Go ahead. Yeah. Even married for 20 years, we both, Andrew and I both have been married for a long time. You've been with Sanjay a long time. I've been with Yvonne a long time. It's, the, it's amazing how much changes when you're able to take responsibility for your side of things also because it becomes clearer what's not your fault it's like i know what's my fault i'm starting to learn what is actually your fault and not me projecting or taking on too much that balance is amazing well, it's, it's, not that i've struck it but <laughs> yeah it's scary but i feel like it is like the like it is the superpower that we that only we can give ourselves i mean and i think about some of the times where i'm like oh fuck i don't want to be wrong i don't want to be wrong i don't want to be vulnerable but it's like the the that micro moment of just saying i mean it, it reminds me of taylor swift uh like what is that uh, that uh uh um you know, oh, I'm sorry. so it's excited me. to hear where this is going. I'm just geeked <laughs> oh, it's to me. hear where That's this is going. I'm me. I'm I'm the, problem. It's, the yes. problem. it's me. And I, yes. you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like, uh, yeah, like it's, you can say uh, it's just a lyric of a song. But when you go, oh, yeah, thank you, Taylor Swift, for normalizing this idea that I am imperfect and human. And again, it's a little bit of a joke, but then it's like, oh, no, it is a superpower. Yeah, go ahead. Sabrina? So part of that too, and it, and I think we the the because I know what, exactly where you guys are going. The pendulum swing of that type of statement is then this self deprecation of well everything's my fault. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, nah, then nah, you nah, become nah. the doormat. And that's exactly, we're not too. fucking doing that. But here, part yeah. of what you guys are describing, part of this radical accountability and acceptance is it's not about shaming or blaming. If I I have an inner, those are parts of me, right? If I shame a twelve year old right now or a ten year old for doing something, do you think you're going to get better results versus understanding? Yeah. Part of radical accountability and acceptance comes into it's not about shame or blame. It's about holding two conflicting truths as once. It's about being able to say, I can look at my parents and say, I love my mother so much. She also wasn't equipped to be the mother that I needed. Yeah, I can totally. hold Amen. two conflicting truths. I can look and say, Joanna, 
you're right. That guy was a fucking asshole and he totally played me. But you know what? I also played a part because I allowed it and I just, I let him back in when, you know what? I didn't have stronger boundaries. You're not judging yourself. You're not shaming yourself because I'm a fucking idiot and I was, no, we need to get rid of the narrative around it and just look at what are the facts here? The fact is I didn't have boundaries. I allowed this to happen because yeah, I didn't know any better a lower. Right. We just, you didn't know. You did the best you could with the information you knew at the time. Well, I, I love, I always love the Marion Williamson statement. You can't give what you don't have. And when I think about what I couldn't give to myself when I was younger, it's like, you know, it, it, it's brilliant to talk about it like that. Having those two conflicting truths that can be really painful and really confusing and to beat yourself up. And then you go, well, you can't give what you don't have. And yeah. then, and that's how Forgive you give yourself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, totally. yeah, yeah. All right. I want to get, um, Sabrina, we have a bunch of like Reddit and reader emails wanting your expert dating and relationship advice. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. By the way, I, I so want you back on the show. There is so much more to mine in your, your personal experiences and how much you have transformed from being, um, you know, really on your knees to a hot mess. <laughs> from a hot mess to <laughs> a to really to to wise and wonderful so so we're gonna have you back but in the meantime i'm gonna start with a quick with a quick um overview and i want your advice and then we'll we'll kind of do round robin here all right so this is from reddit uh reddit uh our dating i i'm so old and stupid <laughs> uh, okay i've been seeing a guy whose profile says he is 23 We've been dating for six weeks, and I just found out when we got carded that he's 35. He says he feels younger and, in quotes, identifies as 23. And people make too big a deal. <laughs> okay, if you're not watching this, we got a thumbs down and a, and a arms crossed. Uh, if you're listening, you're not getting the, the visual cues. People make a big deal out of age anyway. Things have been otherwise amazing. I'm 24. He's been so great. But it really threw me off, and he was so unfazed by me asking and dismissive of it. I don't know. Should this be a deal breaker? I, if anybody could see Sabrina's face, you would say, can we just move on? Because that deal <laughs> is done. Because here's the issue. It's not about the age difference. It's the fact he fucking lied. It's not. Who gives a shit that he's 35 and you're 24? I do. It's a little grooming, but that's fine. It's fine. It's a different story. But at the end of the day, fine, sure, you want to go live your life, girl. He lied to you. And then on top of it, not only did he lie, he was dismissive. So he didn't even allow you to process and go, hey, this bothers me without going, nah, you don't know what you're talking about. That's no big deal. You need to get over it. Run as fast as you fucking can, my lady. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, what you I want to talk about grooming? It's one thing to be like, hey, I'm 11, 11 years older than you. Here's why I'm immature. You're very mature. Grooming is lying about your age. <laughs> to someone 11 years younger than you. That's so messed up. And then gaslighting them on top of it. To, I don't know why you're, what's Ooh. the big deal? Age is just a number. And it's like, no, R. Kelly, okay? It's not yeah. like, this is, this is not a Leah, okay? This is real life of, no, that's inappropriate. When someone starts off, and that's always been my issue when people lie about their height or their age or anything on the apps, you're starting off with a lie. You're giving me reasons to not trust you before I've even totally. fucking met you. And so just to be sure, it is not OK to lie or stretch the truth on an uh, online dating profile or app, correct? To me, I don't understand the point. If I can't be honest and authentic with who I am, then I don't know why I need to pretend. Usually the reason people do that is because they want to get into the younger age demographic. This guy wants a younger woman and he doesn't want to admit that he's 35. And why is that? Is it just pure biology? I have friends that do it. And it's because they're not actually ready for a relationship and they just like the validation of younger women wanting them. Like, it's just, I have a, one of my friends specifically and he lies about his height and his age because he said, he's like, well, once they get to know me and I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not a, once I go out on the date, you get to know me, then we'll be okay. You started with me and authentically, I'm not going to accept that. I think if you're a guy to get a, a, an adult man who's over 35, as long as the person is an adult who he's dating, fine but the lying shows that he's not out for a relationship he's out for somebody who he can manipulate that's, that's all it is say. like control kind of control issues little dominance okay sabrina can you see that it starts with i recently went out can you read that yes i recently went out on a date with a guy that i met on tinder we never met before our date but we texted for about a week prior and i thought he was a really nice guy 
Our date went well. He was a little pompous and a little overly flirty, but a nice guy nonetheless. We live in college in a college town, and the restaurant we went to was walking distance to my apartment, so he offered to walk me home after. I thought this was such a green flag and really appreciate his offer as it was late and getting dark outside. I accept his offer. He walks me home, and I tell him how I appreciate it. I even try to set up another date on the spot. He then offers to come inside and show me a few local bars he knows of. I thought this was weird because he knows I'm a local. So I tell him we could get together in the morning for coffee so he can show me uh, my treat. He tries pretty hard to convince me that it's still early and we can plan it really quickly. But I tell him I have to work on a few homework assignments. He accepts this, but he asked me to come in and use my bathroom, which kind of made my heart sink. I tell him he can use my leasing office restroom, which is right inside the lobby of my apartment. And he became noticeably irritated. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines of, I didn't realize you were such an uptight bitch. Woof. I'll use the 7-Eleven bathroom. And he walked away. I felt horrible. Am I wrong? I, 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 no, she's not wrong. There, this, this just hurt my heart that there is a person alive who would feel bad for honoring their boundaries and not allowing someone to manipulate them. Like, I, my heart is broken. That, my heart. My heart is broken because somewhere along the line, she learned that setting a boundary would mean that she was going to lose somebody or that setting a boundary made her a bad person or a caregiver in her life taught her that, like my father, I never set boundaries. I never, I, to the point where I'll be very fucking candid right now, I allowed sexual things to happen with men because I was scared to say no in that moment because no one ever taught me how the fuck to do that. Oh my God. And so Sabrina, I would just. Thank you. Honestly, can I just pause there and say thank you for telling that truth? Because so many women listening to this now are both um, feeling so validated and so heartbroken. I mean, back to the two conflicting truths, because it's like, oh, my God, we don't know better. And then we feel shame on top of it. So thank you for telling that truth, because so many women, that same thing, like they just they feel badly saying no. They feel badly disappointing a guy and whether it's saying no to something else or no to sexual advances. I mean, so scared, right? You know, like yeah. you're in that moment and you're like, I don't know. And I remember I had a guy that kind of pulled the same thing as what she's describing. And I remember like we went to dinner and I came back and he was like, let me just, oh, let me see the view from your apartment. And I looked at him and I said, the answer is fucking no. If you don't like that, I'll say it again. I'm going to go up to my house now. Have a good night. And that's it. Like, not feeling scared to say no because somebody that disrespects your boundaries like this and what breaks my heart is so she goes right back to i felt horrible am i wrong because let me guess as a kid if you set a boundary your caregiver would go here she is being a little uptight bitch and it's reaffirmed then here we go you date your parents this is going to blow your mind but what i've just finished writing a book about teenage boys and what we learned is there's a lot of teenage boys who go through this too now where they're afraid to say no and not only is it like someone in their life told them they're not allowed to have boundaries, on top of that, they have this weight of guys always want it and guys never say no. So that I just, it's just a whole other element where you're talking about women. And I'm sure, especially with our, I'm Generation X, the pressure that we were under to, to be sexy was so outrageous, but it also is happening to boys and men. It's like, wow, where did we get the idea that anybody out there is not allowed to say no? Yeah, no, that is a, I think it's so important for boys. Uh, I have two boys, 11 and 14, and I feel like there were just a handful of very high profile cases of sexual assault and just this idea of forget no means no, like yes means yes, right? And and it, it it's like, you know, that the vast, vast, vast majority of the time you need to believe the victim. And yeah, I actually dated a guy, one of my earliest boyfriends, was falsely accused of sexual assault and it freaking wrecked him. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm. And so it's like, okay, how do we avoid that? To your point, Joanna, to, to teach our boys for sure, but also our girls. It's like just having that, um, that wisdom and, and, and really yes means yes. And that, and like it, nothing short of yes is, is okay. And being able to accept a no. You know, it's like yeah, we teach them how to say, but it's also like, but how do you accept someone else? And when this guy who's saying, I didn't realize you're such an uptight bitch, it's like, let me guess, your mommy and daddy told you you never do anything wrong, that the world revolves around you, that you're my little boy and no one will ever. T it's like, 
I can already see anybody who is pushy, the first d- fucking rule number one when it comes to are you dating a narcissist or not? Say no. Say no to someone. T- I think no is the sexiest word. And you know why? Because I was never allowed to say it. I shared a wow, story earlier where I said no to my father and he disowned me because it's a scary word because you are scared you're going to lose people. But here's what's scarier. If I don't say no, I'm going to lose myself. And that is way too expensive of a price. Totally. You know, that's a really interesting idea. And maybe you advocate for this uh, already, and I'm just picking up on it a little slowly. But the idea of almost like pressure testing somebody early on, and, you know, you could say yes, you could say no, you're, you know, you could go either way, but it almost feels like a really wise hack to see how somebody responds early on as like a litmus test and just be like, nah, that's not for me today. And if they're a dick about it, or, you know, bitch about it, you know, because yeah. let's face it, women can be narcissists and, and jerks too. Then it's like, you know what? I just I just pressure tested you and you failed the fucking pressure test. And so whew, I'm glad I gave myself that versus saying I'd rather, you know, learn early on. Right. Because if they can't take your no, especially on something relatively low stakes, to your point, it's a huge price to pay to lose yourself in the relationship. Scratch the surface. Ask, why do you think my first date with my partner now? I asked him, what are your religious beliefs? Political. Do you want kids? Do you want marriage? What do you like? How'd your last relationship end? What did it teach you about yourself? What are things you're no longer willing to? And it wasn't like me fucking spit firing, boop, 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 boop. We were on a, a hike for three hours and we were talking and people and having good conversations. And I, I'll preface, people are like, a hike. I'm like, yeah, it was very public. It wasn't in the middle. We weren't in like a middle of an island. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to see if I ask you things, how do you answer? If I say no, and that's why I'm a big fan of like, stop just going out to dinner for dates. Go do something like Ikea. Go do something yeah. stressful. Go do something that shows me, you know why? The You know how I knew my partner was for me? I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, it wasn't because, yeah, this ex is great and he's attractive and I feel very good <laughs> with him. Tell you why. Because we went on a hike after like four months of dating and we went on a hike and all trails, like he showed it to me and it said an easy hike. It lied. It was not. It ended up being four hours in the middle of the desert, about 110 degrees. We didn't have like we had water, but we didn't expect this to happen. By the time we realized what happened, we were about two hours into the hike. We looked at each other and he was like, oh, my God, this is not safe. Like we need to get back. We had the dog. And what ended up happening is we band together, we opened up the backpack, we planned it, and we were like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we strategized. No one blamed anybody, no one got angry about it. I wasn't like, how dare you? Instead, it was teamwork. We need to get to safety. And we did that. And I remember getting into the car and just being like, oh my God, we didn't die. We did it. Oh my God. And just looking at him and I was like, yo, if we can get through this and we've had fun doing it, all things considered, and had a photo from it we can get through anything. Okay, this is like reading erotica for me. Like that is the sexiest <laughs> story I ever could have heard. They're like two capable people solved a major problem and they were kind to each other. My brain's like lighting up fireworks. Yeah, yeah totally. Very, very <laughs> sexy. Very sexy. Okay, uh, I've got another one for you. This is a, this one breaks my heart. Um, oh God, it sucks, but I'm sure a lot of women and a few men will relate to it. This is on... Um, profile pictures and um and shape and and body size um i feel like back in like elementary school you're like oh okay you remember you used to look time at the paragraphs read, yeah, that's anxiety. Read time. <laughs> i used to oh, that was my too, anxiety right? figuring out where i was going to read so i could prep okay i've been using tinder for a few weeks now my profile picture is a picture of me at the store that i used at work or I used to work at. I didn't use any filters. You can see my uh, from my midriff up to the top of my head, but to be honest, I was wearing a sweater. I'm 5'8", 162-pound female, by the way. I met this guy on Tinder, and we hit it off. He was really funny, and we had some hobbies in common. When we met, he was completely different from how he was over chat. He didn't say anything to me on his own and just answered questions with simple yeses and nos. He seemed angry the whole time and left the date after about an hour, saying he was supposed to meet his friend. I thought that maybe he was shy in real life and text him afterwards to thank him for the date and ask him if he had an okay time. He didn't reply for a few days, but this morning I got the text. Just a heads up, not everyone is into big girls. You should really let guys know ahead of time so they don't get put on the spot. Just my advice. Hope you find what you're looking for. Best wishes. I felt really embarrassed after reading this text. I didn't mean to put anyone on the spot. I know I'm not thin, but I'm also not that heavy. It never occurred to me that this was something I had to disclose before meeting someone. But I do remember reading some posts online where people were simply disappointed that a date was bigger than they let on. Am I one of those deceptive dates? Am I the a-hole? Well, first of all, the idea of being five foot eight and 160 pounds being a big girl sends me into a rage. 
I'm five foot seven and 150 pounds. And if someone called me a big girl, I'd be like, I'll show you big. Exactly. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'll show you a big fucking scar across your face. Now, here's the reality. Here's the thing. We, as dickish as what he said is, is like, I am 100% like, it's just, that's so fucked up. But then we have to look and say, no, she's not the asshole. But it's like, but are you not showing who you really are? Because there is like, I, I've even had my own partner say that he'll look at photos and he'll go out and it's like, you don't look anything like your photos. And that's just not because I've had people do that where they show up and they claim they're six feet and they're five, eight and I'm five, eight. So I'm wearing heels and I'm like, I'm fucking towering over you, dude. Like you were not honest and you did not allow me to make the choice. I don't think she was an asshole about this. I think he was an asshole the way he said it but at the same time I think what he was doing like I wish he had just said hey your photos were not an accurate depiction of who you are I showed up it didn't match moving forward it would be better if you were just more accurate about your looks online because it is deceptive to people he's not wrong for saying something like that but it's about is there validity to but it aren't there usually a lot of pictures you don't usually just have one well that's what i'm saying it depends on that's what i mean by it's not yeah. that i think the issue with him is that he called her a bigger girl that's just inappropriate like you said that's that's perception i could be big to some people or small to others yeah but it's about if you only have one photo or two photos and they're neck up then to the other person it's like then i would look at him and go but you were not being a better buyer i know that if somebody only has neck up photos then maybe they're not as secure with their body because they're not showing it, right? But that's also, it's like, it's a double-edged sword. I don't blame anybody here. I think he was an asshole with how he said it and it's totally inappropriate and this poor woman does not deserve that. But then I would go to her and say, okay, well then maybe we need to have more accurate photos of who you are in your profile so that you feel confident with who you're showing up as so you don't have to deal with someone going, hey, that's not you. I've had that where guys, I'm like, yo, that was 30 years ago. Like, what are we doing? Here? <laughs> well, we have to remember Sabrina's actually a dating coach. So she, so if, if that's me, if I'm that girl, okay, and I go to Sabrina, I'm asking her to tell me what happened here. And she's going to look at my photos and be like, this doesn't really look like you. And you're beautiful. You should show what you look like. I would hope you'd say that, Sabrina. I feel like 100%. you would. 100%. Whereas like this guy, nobody hired him to give his opinion on what her profile photo should look like. That's where I'm like, first of all, to say no, not everybody likes bigger girls. Well, lots of people like bigger girls. 100%. She's not bigger. But also, who asked you? You could just say, thanks for coming out. It's not going to, It's I don't, I don't feel what I need to feel, but I really appreciate your time. Nobody asked his opinion. But and if I she totally, came to you, she would be asking your opinion. And she should. I totally get what you mean. I think the devil's advocate here is also feedback, right? I agree with you. He did not need to leave the, like, get fucked, dude. Like, you are a dickhead. You don't need to say that. What he could have said is, hey, you know, I don't feel a connection here. I wish you all the best. I just wanted to be honest. You might not be, you not, might not be asking for advice, but your profile photos were very different than the person that I saw in, in person. If you want some unsolicited advice, that's my feedback for you. Because to me, it's like, if I yeah, was going I, around I agree. going- you know, I, like, I, why am I having these experiences where yeah, no yeah. one's going to tell you, but it's how you fucking say it. I, yeah, and there's got to be a lot of people doing feedback. that with Facetune. Like, think of how much Facetuning is going on where, like, people I know in real life, I see their pictures and I'm like, who even is that person? I can imagine with dating, that's a major risk that someone just Facetune the crap out of themselves. That's and where I have to Joanna, say, like, when you say face tuning, do you mean like using filters or what? what yeah, all it's are like a, an app. It's sort of like an app where like I could look at myself and be like, I'm going to vamoosh these age spots. I'm going to lift my cheekbones a little bit. I'm going to just suck that little guy up. It's it's Photoshop. Yeah, air, it's, but it's like a airbrushing, really easy for, uh, airbrushing for yeah. uh, the proletariat. Yeah, I could look like Megan Fox if I tried that yeah. thing. Like I could make myself yeah. look like I could put blue eyes on me. I could change my bone structure. I could change everything about me. And that's where I say it's not this poor girl. Like it's not about the fact that like, the, the, the reality is her weight is not the issue here because that's a personal thing against him. And this piece of shit has no right to tell this woman anything about the way she fucking looks. The only discrepancy is, hey, I don't feel like your photos were accurate is one thing. Very different than the way he went about it. And I hope this guy gets help because he fucking needs it. Yeah. Okay. We've got one more. Um, Joanna, do you want to read this one? Do, can you see that had three dates with a girl yeah. last month? Hold on. But y'all, I have to put my glasses on. So get ready. Sexy librarian. Yeah, sexy librarian. To work now. Okay. Let's this one is here. on ghosting. Had three dates with a girl last month. She reached out to me about a week after the third one, told me that she had a fantastic time and proceeded to ask me a few random questions. I responded and asked her a few questions in turn. Radio silence. The message was marked as unread, but she probably saw it. 
I then reached out to her two weeks later to check up on her and told her that I'd like to see her again. And I was left on red. She doesn't owe me an explanation, but to completely cut someone out like that feels incredibly cold and hurtful. I won't reach out to her again, but this has resulted in me overthinking and blaming myself for her behavior over the past several weeks. Why do women do this? Okay, can I just say men do it too? And <laughs> I, I feel that 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 just terrible sting of rejection and how even though if somebody else is being such a jerk, how we can't help but feel so personal and how rejected we feel. So for anybody who's like, oh, I just, I see you. I see you. I feel you. I am you. Because rejection is not unique to you. I felt no. it too. And now here's one thing I'll say. So at the end of this, why do women do this? So asking why, 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 why is actually a defense mechanism because he's avoiding actually looking at like what's happening within him. He said it. I'm overthinking and blaming myself. So that is this area of opportunity for anybody listening. When we ask, well, why do women do this? Here's the reality. If I told you the why, oh, she's insecure. Maybe she met somebody else. It's not going to make you feel better, right? Because finding out the why, oftentimes you're like, cool, I still feel like shit. What I would suggest for him is what my, my friend Brent, Britt Frank, who she's just such a brilliant neuropsychotherapist, always recommends tr transition why to I don't like. I don't like that women do this. Okay, what don't I like about this? It makes me feel inferior. It makes me feel like I'm not good enough. Okay, well, how is my worth being tied into someone else's actions? Then we can start to, because again, why do women do this? Or why do people ghost? If I gave you the reasons they were chasing a feeling, they weren't chasing you. She has a fear of confrontation. She didn't want to hurt your feelings. It's not about, very often we think, oh, there's something wrong with me. That's a core belief because someone secure who knows who they are would say, whoa, that that's the biggest difference when we think of insecure versus secure a secure attacher will say that's their issue they chose to ghost me their inability to communicate with me speaks volumes about them versus someone insecure is what's wrong with me that they would do this because we automatically when we go to that insecure thought process it goes back to childhood of there's something wrong with me my caregiver couldn't handle me which means no one can this, my heart breaks for anybody dealing with things like this, but we have to transition and reframe so that we can understand what's happening within us. Because what I would go to him is, so what are your core beliefs? Where did you learn this behavior? What? And it's not that it's going to change anything. It's just more to be able to cope with this so that we can hold the right people accountable. Joanna, like you were saying earlier, it's not about blaming or shaming and saying, what did I do wrong? But it's about those two conflicting truths. I can be hurt that this person did this and this feels like shit. I hate it but I can also know that this speaks volumes about their character and does not have to do with my worth. Yeah. Um, have you had the experience of being ghosted or have you go, are you, tell the truth, uh, oh Sabrina, have God. you ghosted anybody? Never have I ghosted in my oh, life okay, because I, that, because the only thing, okay, so here's the thing. I don't believe that like, if somebody, like I've had a first date with someone and then, you know, nobody says anything or maybe they text me after, had a great night and then like, I don't respond and then it fizzles and no one says anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To okay. me, people will say, oh, that's ghosting. I'm like, no, no one didn't. Like no one contacted anybody. It, it's it's just, uh, I, I lived in New York and LA. I was going on five, six dates a week. You think I was going to fucking send a dissertation to every person I went out with and deal with their attitude? But yeah, I the first time I was ghosted, I was 20 and this guy and I had been dating for two months. Like, dating had been together like I saw him that morning accidentally like in the streets in New York and he was like baby I can't wait I'll see you tonight I'm so excited big kiss and I was like yay we was meeting my friends like this was it and I never heard from him again like oh he my stood God. me up and have you ever heard from him, him since the only thing was three weeks later and I thought he died at this point I'm like yeah. he's dead no sh turns out my friend had a fake uh, this was okay, Cupid. I'm aging myself. My friend had a fake okay, Cupid profile. So I used it to go and I was like, is he going to go online? Is he going to go online? Then he messaged the fake profile saying, you're becoming a regular around here because he saw me looking. And I was like, oh, funny. oh, so he's alive. Saw him two weeks later in the street. I flicked him off as I walked by him. I got a text from him. It was cowardice. I owe you an apology, an explanation. Never got it. It's been 10 years and I have to this day, no idea what the fuck happened to this person. And he because how could this have been about me? Listen, there's a difference between if you have an issue with someone, you have paths where they're like, hey, you're fucking insufferable. I cannot talk to you. You explode on me every time. Okay. Maybe that's why this person opted out versus if you're like, I didn't do anything here. I can't own this. That's on them. That's all coming from yeah. him. Uh, but I just, I mean, just for everybody's sake, I mean, back to the, the beauty of accountability, when you're accountable to yourself and you're accountable to others, it's, it's how you set yourself free, right? And I realize there are people that it's like, oh, I just, 
just not feeling it or whatever excuse or whatever rationalization. I mean, I'm going to say you, you, you listener, me, Andrea, we we're all guilty of not being accountable. And I just feel like as a decent human being, when you're, you know, if it's like, I'm just not feeling it, like, okay, just tell me you're not feeling it. Like, that's fine. I don't even need like, to your point, I don't need the long dissertation. But if you just tell me you're not feeling it, that, that sets me free and it sets you free. Okay, we have time for one more. Sabrina, this one's all you. Uh, this one is, this one is ex- on exclusivity. It starts with, we have been dating for four months. We've been dating for four months. I had a feeling he was sleeping with others, which is fine. But then I found him texting another girl while sitting right beside me. Nice. This time I thought was a prime opportunity at, to ask about it since I saw it and we were on a weekend trip together. So I asked, are you seeing anyone else and who are you texting? The messages were about him booking a hotel and a flight, excited to see her tomorrow. While we were together and while we still had plans to be together tomorrow, he kept on lying. So I said, I had fun seeing, I said, have fun seeing her tomorrow and have fun never speaking to me again and asked him to drive me home. Was I right or was I being dramatic? Oh, baby girl. There is a difference between... I've had two dates with someone and I found out they're dating other people. And and I've had this where people will freak out and be like, oh, fine. And, you know, enjoy fucking that other girl. And you're like, dude, this person literally does not know you. Like, they're a lot. This is a whole new level of disrespect. This is someone who is trying to have his cake and eat it too. This is, this is also where I'd go and I, may I be stricken, that I kind of have to call her out as well and say, you guys never talked about intentions. What do you guys want? Have you had conversations mm-hmm. with this person? Because Fair. like I led, it's not about blaming anybody here, but I'm going to be honest. If I'm dating someone for a few months and I look over and they're texting another woman saying, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. There's a disconnect here. Something's off. What conversations are you guys having? Like what's happening here? Because if someone is consistent and reciprocal and you trust them and you know that It's okay that you're in the first month dating other people, but then eventually the conversation, it doesn't, this drives me fucking insane. People wait. Oh, when, when can I ask, what are we? Why the fuck are you asking other people permission for what it is that you are? You need to come up and you proverbial, you come with a fucking empowerment of, Hey, I like you. I don't want to date anyone else. I'd love to delete the apps. And I'd love to know what are your thoughts on that? So can much you, more empowering. Yeah, can anybody than... who needs that rewound, uh, just rewind it so you can say it again to yourself. Just, it's come with a place of empowerment. I know what I, what, that's what my partner did to me. We were taking a shower after about a month of dating. We had just hooked up and he looked over to me and he said, I deleted the apps. I'm not saying that you have to, but I wanted to let you know where I'm at. I like you. I want to be exclusive. I don't want to date anybody else. And I'd love to hear how you feel about that. That is brilliant. And it just gives, I mean, that phrasing, and it can work in so many different ways, Sabrina. I love that because it really, it's it's direct. It's not needy. It, it gives somebody an out. They can say, well, let's talk about it. Like, I just feel like there is so much bad behavior because people are afraid of rejection. They don't want others to feel uncomfortable. So I feel like when you can bring being comfortable and just direct in a constructive way that that is a game changer right but even that takes maturity but i you how you phrased those what you're and what's your boyfriend's name ryan ryan good job buddy uh just how he phrased that to you and how you said it in your own words it's just like oh good we get to be adults like that's it like this yeah, isn't it's a, also this a isn't test magic. in a way like if you're being authentic, if you, Sabrina, had responded with like, whoa, 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 buddy, let's like stop trying to control me. And like, this is a little aggressive. He would know that the two of you were not in the same place. And it, he didn't intend it as a test. But it's like, are we both healthy, functioning adults in the same places in our lives? It's a lovely test. It's authentic. Yeah. And, yeah. And what and I responded back with, I want to go slow. And on paper, people would go, what does that mean? And I explained it. I said, let me explain what that means to me. That means I'm not trying to expedite the stages of a relationship quicker than they need to be. I was honest with him. I said, I think you're amazing. I really like you, but I don't feel as connected to you as you feel connected to me. You are, oh, he's more rigid. He's more closed off. And when I said that to him, he was like, you know what? This is, and he even said it. He's like, this is feedback I've gotten before that I'm not as open. I really mm-hmm. do want to try being more vulnerable with you because I know that I need to in order for this relationship to work. Mm-hmm. And that was why I continued Yay, to date him. It wasn't yeah. like, 
It, because people have this misconception that, oh, I just met this super secure partner and he was just showed up at my door and both of it. No, I had no. anxiety. He had avoidance. We worked through it because we communicated. Same yeah. thing of like when we were just talking about ghosting of just telling mm-hmm. someone, hey, I think you're fantastic, but this is not a connection I want to pursue. I wish you all the best. I did totally. videos. I have done a video that gone has gone viral like 10 different times. The amount of trolls. This sounds like HR. I'd rather be ghosted. Ew, shut up. Shut her oh. up. And it's like because people are terrified of directness because they mm. take that as aggression because no one's ever been fucking direct with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and that's a big yes. red flag. They're telling yeah. on themselves right there. And I and I know because I think about when I had the choice between the cheater and the really nice rock star. <laughs> but jeff the rock star like what a gift he got letting me walk away at that phase of my life like not to disparage myself but he needed something different it wasn't yeah me at that point right yeah amen so many lessons learned all right sabrina zohar you are amazing i am eager to get you back on open relationships uh you guys can find sabrina at do the work her amazing podcast you'll learn a ton from it as well as a huge presence on tiktok instagram all the socials sabrina zohar and do the work uh sabrina thank you this was amazing thank you guys for having me can't wait for our next chat yeah 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 awesome yeah so fun all right oh my god that was amazing i love her she is hilarious oh my gosh if i was dating i would hire her yeah yeah so honest but like so honest and harsh but loving (laughs) no she gets it and like no nonsense like even her whole point about being direct is a is a superpower and honestly she reminds me since we just also talked with marianne williamson about how marianne talks about um less coddling and more being blunt you know and direct it just it does feel like there is so much value in telling that truth in a way that people can actually hear it right and that to me is the is that uh superpower right and honestly i think of it for myself as a mom as a leader as a sibling in all the relationships it's like okay i need to give this feedback because it's good for me and good for them but how do i give it in a way that they can actually hear it versus go yeah. right into the hills and i really like how empowering she is while she's laying the truth out because a lot of people are so proud of being like like oh i'm being brutally honest but they're being hurtful whereas hers is so like i got fired up you know well it feels motivating right because like when you realize that that path is available to you in a way that you can choose yourself you can break those hard habits and that that honestly the promised land is on the other side but only you can do it for yourself to me it's like a big freaking hallelujah and amen brian do you have a number one takeaway that you're going to apply immediately to your life as a single man uh getting ready to be engaged and married i was like I definitely not, not single. single yeah you're not single. So I, I mean <laughs> I was not like, married i meant not getting married. engaged yeah you know? yeah uh no i mean i liked a lot of the stuff about doing the work and the radical accountability um there was something early on too that i liked where we were talking about um uh, it's not apps, it's human nature. Like, like this isn't a new thing. And and I really liked what you were saying about the uh, almost like way that you play with someone's like biology in the way that like that person is going like giving you those dopamine and adrenaline spikes and then how that's literally giving you almost like an addiction style response. And it's like, man, we as humans, we're just, we're, 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 have, we're bad. Have you, ever <laughs> heard of, have you ever heard of the sunk cost fallacy? Oh yeah. I, think of all of the ways in which we trick ourselves into staying with somebody because we believe that the time we spent being with them and trying to help them and whatever else is lost. And in reality, you have all these experiences over that time. Nothing's actually lost, but it keeps you trapped just like a just like a a, a slot machine at a casino. You just keep pulling that arm down because you yeah. feel like, man, I can't give up now. Meanwhile, it's I'm wasting hate- your life away. It's why I hate when couples that are like relatively newer, like, move in together or they get a dog or anything like that because then it just adds more to that sunken cost fallacy oh then we have to move out then it's gonna be so awkward then we have to deal with the dog parents or whatever it is and it's like uh you guys are just like adding more and more fuel to the fire and like forcing yourselves to stay together yeah it's a um i just i feel like it's such an opportunity every time to check your own accountability 
And, um, you know, even if you're in your later uh, twilight years, if you're in a bad relationship, like sincerely bad, and you've done everything you reasonably can, and you're still in a bad relationship, then it's time to, you know, just either have that that final last really brutal conversation if you haven't, or if you have, then it's time to um, to part ways. And especially if you're younger, right? I mean, because, yeah, the sunk cost fallacy will keep you oh, foolishly. And even, I mean, I feel like Stan Tadkin, if he was here, he would talk about its attachment biology, that it's so freaking hard and scary to part ways. But so often that's that is really the best choice. Anyway, well, especially more to think come. about Sabrina's oh. mom, that yeah. story, Sabrina, her mom, in essence, was abandoning her by staying in that relationship. So, yeah, it's all there. Really yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, such a I just I love her, her candor and her energy and just even uh, what a, I feel like what a champion she is for people making um, beautiful changes in their lives. So. All right. Thanks for tuning in to Open Relationships Transforming Together. If you have not subscribed, please do. Please rate our show wherever you get your podcasts on iHeart, on Spotify, YouTube. It is so helpful. It's also really helpful to get your feedback and advice. You're welcome to email us at openrelationships at your tango.com. And we look forward to seeing you on another episode soon. Thanks for tuning in.